So today we answer the question, is fruit harmful to human health? Well, I found a very interesting video by a doctor with 20 plus years of experience. And he is going to explain the dangers, the hazards of fruit consumption. Now, of course, when we hear from doctors, when we think about doctors, we assume these are heavily qualified, very informed people. So he's made some explosive claims here, right? I think it's a it's a pretty uh, big claim to say that uh, you know fruit is dangerous for human health, right? For dangerous for human consumption. So I'm very interested to hear what he has to say about this topic. And you know what? Maybe I can be learning something here uh, from what he has to say. So we're we're gonna take a look at this together and see uh, how things shake out. So you decided to get healthy. You stopped eating those chips and drinking all the soda, the soft drinks. You stopped eating all those sweets and you really cut back on saturated fats. You started eating lots of fruits, more vegetables than you'd like. You started drinking fruit-filled fruit smoothies once or twice or three times a day because those are obviously full of magical phytonutrients and other good things for you. But the problem is, is over the course of time, you haven't really lost any fat. Maybe you've even put on some belly fat. You've noticed that your bowels are not behaving appropriately. Your skin is flaring up. Your joints are achy. What's going on here? So, <laughs> fruit-filled fruit smoothies once, twice, or even three times a day. Uh, that's that's kind of peculiar, right? I mean, when people eat fruit, does it have to be in a fruit-filled fruit smoothie. Um, it's kind of a bizarre way to put it. Uh, of course, he's being a little tongue-in-cheek. That's fine. Uh, but now he has alluded to having more fruit um, and not losing weight, having more belly fat, and gut health issues. Right. So these are the these are some of the explosive claims here. So. I'm going to assume that he's going to explain uh, how fruit... Now, is he talking about fruit smoothies as in like you're, you're uh, adding dairy, right? Because if you're doing a fruit smoothie, but you're adding dairy, well, then it wouldn't really seem like the fruit is the problem. It seemed like the dairy would be the problem. So he didn't say you started eating more grapes, you started eating more cantaloupe, honeydew, or watermelon. You started eating more kiwis. He didn't say that. He said fruit smoothies. It's kind of weird because, well, now you, you, know, you put other things besides fruit in fruit smoothies. Um, so you're kind of muddying the waters a little bit, right? You're kind of baking, baking, sneaking that in there a little bit, right? So that's going to alter the kind of results that you get from what he's talking about. Well, let's go on. I'm going to explain in this video about seven facts about fructose. Is fruit really bad? And at the end of this video, I'm going to give you a bonus thing that fructose does that's really a huge deal. So you don't want to miss that. I'm Dr. All right. So this right out the gate um, is a bait and switch. So you start off the video talking about fruit, right? Then pivot to fruit smoothies. Right, implying that you're doing fruit in like milk and other ingredients. And then he pivots again to fructose, right? So we're now two subjects removed from the original claims about fruit. So we jump from fruit, then to fruit smoothies, and now he's going to dive into fructose. So he switched topics twice, right? So this is a bait and switch on top of a bait and switch. So he switched twice. All right. Uh, so this is a pretty giant deviation from what he originally started talking about. Now, I don't know if he did that on purpose or if this was kind of an accidental thing, but right out the gate, it's a very disingenuous thing to do. But let's see if he cleans it up. Dr. Ken Berry, a family physician with 20 years of clinical experience. And this video is going to help you understand why too much fructose is a bad thing. So fructose is one of... So he's going to explain why too much fructose is a bad thing. So are we no longer talking about fruit? Are we now talking about fructose? 
And then, now if he says too much fructose, so he's not saying that fructose in and of itself is a problem. He's saying that too much of it is a problem. So now, based on that, I am now going to assume that he's going to tell us how much fructose is too much fructose and how you calculate how much fructose is too much so you can know to avoid getting too much by accurately uh, and adequately planning out your diet. So let's see if he gives us that information. Of the monosaccharides, it's found in every fruit and uh, big food corporations have found that if they distill it out of corn, they can come up with a very high fructose corn syrup that's very cheap and that tastes very, very good to the human tongue, including your tongue. Uh, fructose inherently is not bad. The human body can digest a little bit of fructose, but if you make the mistake of getting too much fructose in your diet, at least seven things, eight actually, are gonna happen. And I'm gonna explain what those things are, why they happen, and what that leads to. So I'm not- Well, wait a minute. You should explain how much is too much. Because he already said, well, it isn't inherently bad, just if you get too much. So if you're gonna warn someone against too much, then you should probably explain what qualifies as being too much. So he's- he wants to skip to these seven or eight things that are negative side effects of eating too much fructose. But he hasn't really implied or signaled at all that he's going to explain to you how much is too much. Um, so, But let's see if he does. Maybe let's see if I'm wrong. No way trying to imply that you should avoid 100% of fructose from your diet. Eating an occasional handful of berries, occasional an occasional half a banana, an occasional teaspoon, not tablespoon, of honey is probably not that big a deal for most of us. Some of us, however, are very sensitive. So, an occasional handful of berries. Well, how much, how much fructose is that? Is he going to give us solid numbers? Like, for example, a handful. Is it a child's hand, a teenager's hand, a big man hand? Um, is this, could this handful be a measurement, like a quarter cup, a half a cup, a whole cup? If it is a whole cup, how many grams of fructose is in the whole cup, right? Does he say? He doesn't really seem to be given any concrete measurements. Then he says a half a banana, right, is fine on occasion. Now, is this a quarterly occasion, an annual occasion, a monthly occasion, a weekly occasion? A daily occasion? Because he says occasion. Well, when you say on occasion, what does that mean exactly? Right? That's a very loose term when you say occasionally. Right? You can have it occasionally. Right? Um, so, uh, this isn't really a great way to teach someone how much fructose is too much. Right? When you use these loose terms. And he's using loose terms like too much or occasionally so so if you don't want to be pinned down on making a false claim you want your language to be as loose and slippery as possible right so if you can't really support the claim then make sure you don't give any specific numbers you kind of want to be as broad and vague and loose as slippery as possible when you make these kind of claims so that's more of like a rhetorical thing so that i'm just saying that um, because media literacy is a big part of what we're watching here, right? Because, um, you know, everybody has their biases, but it's very important that when you watch and consume media and the things that people say, you really do have to apply some scrutiny to it and understand media literacy because the way that people will not blatantly lie, but lie by omission or tell half truths, these kind of things. They make claims that are kind of true, but not really, or technically true, but not in a genuine sense, and this kind of stuff, right? Uh, so, uh, this is the kind of thing that you want to, to watch out for when people make really strong claims, but then follow it up with very loose, slippery, vague language. Sensitive to the effects of fructose, and you need to figure out if you're one of those people or not. What I'm talking 
how do you figure out if you're one of those people? So like, for example, uh, for most people, the half a banana on occasion, whatever an occasion is, is fine. But then some people, they can eat the half banana, but not the whole banana. That's what he's implying. But how do you know if you're that person? Let's see if he explains how you know. ...about in this video is increasing your intake of fructose if you're following the dietary guidelines from the American Diabetes Association, American Heart Association, the My, My Plate guidelines from the U.S. federal government, all of these are going to leave you ingesting way too much fructose for your low-carb human physiology. Okay, so he mentioned the ADA, the AHA, My Plate guidelines. Now... He mentioned these three. Now, is he going to, again, give any numbers? Is he going to clearly define those guidelines? Is he going to clearly say, hey, these guidelines say that you should have X amount of grams of fructose per day or anything like that? Is he going to give any kind of numbers? Because if he is now going to imply that uh, these guidelines, that these... Uh, uh, organizations are giving well you should probably accurately define what the issue with these guidelines are um, and specifically like give the numbers right like they tell you to consume 70 percent more than you should or 30 percent more than you should or you know things like that you know you know this meal structure it's this it's it, it's this many meals and it should be this many meals. They tell you to get X amount of servings of this particular food and it should only be this amount, right? Be more specific. So let's see if he gives any specificity at all. Ingesting lots of fructose doesn't really raise your blood sugar. So if you're a diabetic and you eat a lot of fructose and then check your blood sugar afterwards, it kind of gives you a false sense of security because you didn't have that big of a blood sugar spike but at the same time, you ingested way too much fructose for your biochemistry to be able to healthily handle. Now let's dig into the seven things. So then he mentions, well, you can eat a lot of fructose and it not raise your blood sugar. Well, you can eat fruit and it'll raise your blood sugar. So this kind of cements the fact that he's not talking about fruit at this point. He's specifically talking about fructose, right? Because you can be diabetic and eat like, you know, two cups of grapes and see a blood sugar spike, right? So if he's implying, oh, you can eat a ton of fructose and not really see any blood sugar spike, well, that implies that he's no longer talking about fruit at all. Now, does the ADA or the AHA or the MyPlate guidelines, do they explicitly say uh, to eat a, an X amount of fructose? Not fruit, but fructose in particular. Like, do they tell you to eat a specific amount of fructose? How much fructose do they tell you to eat, right? Um, he doesn't say. So what he's doing is he's sneaking in premises, right? He's sneaking things into his argument. Because he started with fruit, but fruit can raise your blood sugar. Fruit does raise your blood sugar, right? Because fruit also has, you know, carbohydrates and simple glucose in it and that type of thing, right? Um... But if he's saying you can eat a ton of this stuff and it not raise your blood sugar at all, well, he's not talking about fruit at this point. He's talking specifically about fructose in a vacuum, right? Is that bait and switch that I'm talking about earlier. Um, so he's not giving any specificity and he, I don't know if it's intentionally or unintentionally, has made it clear he's not even talking about fruit at this point. Not even talk, He's not talking about food, period, at this point. I really don't even know what he's talking about now. Is he talking about, like, soft drinks that are loaded with fructose? Is he talking about, like, people just eating fructose in a vacuum that's not even in food form? I don't really particularly know what he's talking about now at this point. But let's see if he clears it up. Things that eating too much fructose causes in your body. And then the bonus one, which is going to blow you away, you're not going to believe that at the end. So the first thing that eating too much fructose does is it raises your uric acid level. And this can raise your blood pressure, hypertension. This can uh, cause you to have a, a much higher increased rate of gout attack if you have gout. 
Uh, a lot of people think eating fat and meat causes gout. Nothing could be further from the truth. I actually have a video on this channel about gout if you want to learn more about that. So that's probably the first form. Well, that's not the first. Um, here's my charitable reading of the claim he just made. Uh, people think meat causes gout, but that couldn't be further from the truth. That's the claim that he made, right? Now, as a doctor, he should know the primary thing that raises uric acid. The primary thing that raises uric acid is called purines, right? And purines are predominantly a result of seafood and meat consumption. So red meat, poultry, and seafood, right? So the foods with the highest purine content right, are animal products. Now, I don't know if he's looked this up or whatever the case is. I'm going to assume that he is completely ill-informed on what purines are, what foods they're found in, or what they cause or anything like that, right? Um, if I wanted to be uncharitable, I would say he's lying, right? Uh, so if I want to be uncharitable, I'm saying he's deliberately lying to you. If I want to be charitable, I would just say that, you know, despite his 20 years of experience as a doctor, he has no idea what causes gout. He has no idea what purines are or what effects they have on uric acid, right? Um, in addition to that, um, there is one thing that uric, that lowers, that lowers uric acid the most, right? Like if you type in the Google search, what food nutrient lowers uric acid? First thing that would come up would be vitamin C. The foods that are the most abundant in vitamin C are fruit, right? So in regards to uric acid, eating fruit would actually lower your uric acid and prevent you from having gout flare-ups because of the high vitamin C content, right? In addition to that, another thing that would help to lower uric acid and prevent gout attacks is quercetin, which is also found in fruit. As a matter of fact, with people who have gout, some of the best foods they can eat are grapefruit, grapes, cranberries, apples. Okay. Those, those are some of the top ones. All right. Um, so since we're on the topic of fruit, well, probably the thing that hurts his argument the most is even mentioning fruit at all in terms of uric acid. I've had people who have gout. And we have been able to reverse that issue with a high fruit diet, right? Uh, so this hurts his argument. If I was him, this is what I'm saying. He probably doesn't even know about the vitamin C thing and how it lowers uric acid and the effect that fruit consumption has on gout. He probably doesn't even know, right? That like you can eat cherries, cranberries, grapefruit, uh, and apples, for example, and that would lower your uric acid and reverse gout. He probably doesn't even know that. Maybe he's never looked into it. I have, because my wheelhouse is chronic illness, right? Uh, so the gout thing, probably not a good example. He also mentioned high blood pressure. Fruit lowers your blood pressure. Why? Because fruit is very water rich and it's high in vitamin C and potassium, antioxidants and B vitamins and things like that, that help to dilate your vascular system for better blood flow right? Your fruit actually helps to lower LDL cholesterol, raise HDL, and produce more nitric oxide, right? Which helps to dilate your vascular system, and dilating your vascular system lowers your blood pressure. So, for example, uh, one grapefruit literally is clinically proven to lower blood pressure. Right, it's nature's natural blood pressure medication. So in terms of high blood pressure, that also hurts his argument. But if we are now following the premise that he is no longer talking about fruit, he was in the beginning, and then he did the bait and switch, and then the bait and switch again. Right, or the bait and switch, and then the switch again. So two switches, one bait, two switches. So he started with fruit, 
then jumped to fruit smoothies. Now he's not even talking about fruit or fruit smoothies, and he's now just talking about fructose. Now, if he's talking about fructose in a, in a vacuum, it's not in food form. Okay, fair enough. I would agree with him. He would be correct on that. And there is um, plenty of scientific data that shows that fructose in a vacuum right, causes these issues. Right? And the way that they, they did those studies was they had groups of people... And in, you know, one group, they drank beverages with just like a regular glucose sugar in it, like table sugar. And the other one was sweetened with fructose. So you had the drinks where the one group, uh, they were drinking a lot of fructose beverages. And the other one were drinking no fructose beverages. They were sweetened with uh, sugar that's not fructose, right? Um, and they showed that in the fructose group, they had all of these issues, you know, after they did blood tests and stuff like that. So that is true about fructose, but the thing is, is that, well, you got to pick which one you're talking about. Are you talking about fruit or are you talking about fructose, right? So that's that bait and switch I'm talking about. But, you know, um, let's see what else he has to say here. It also just increases joint pain in general and can cause flare-ups of skin conditions like acne and eczema and others. Eating or drinking too much fructose raises your levels of VLDL and triglycerides and both of these being high can increase your risk of having a heart attack or of having a stroke now some of these i know sound unbelievable you're you're saying dr barry that if i'm drinking three fruit smoothies a day and eating lots of fruit just like the my plate guidelines tell me to do it's actually increasing my risk of heart attack and stroke mm -hmm. yeah that's what i'm telling you and if you don't believe this i'm going to put a lot of links to research papers down in the show notes Oh, so he's, he added research links. So now, if his claim is true, mm -hmm. those links should be able to tell me that the My Plate guidelines and the guidelines, the dietary guidelines that were made by the ADA and the AHA, he should have statistical data that shows an increase in heart disease risk cholesterol and all of this type of stuff specifically from those guidelines right so the american diabetes association the american heart association they're wrong and he has the data to prove it right so we'll we'll dive into that to see if he actually has that evidence but let's see what else he has to say here below Never blindly believe me or any other doctor, dietitian, or health guru. I want you to look at the research for yourself. Number three, eating or drinking too much fructose can increase your risk of developing fatty liver and fatty pancreas. And even... He still hasn't told us how much fructose is too much yet, by the way. Fatty tongue. What? What? Fatty tongue. Yeah, it's actually one of the leading reasons that people develop obstructive sleep apnea. You see, none of the cells in your body can really use fructose. Only your liver can metabolize it. And when your liver metabolizes a huge fructose load from... How much is a huge fructose load? He's using words like a lot and huge. He's using these words, but he hasn't given any numbers. He hasn't used any, he hasn't used any numbers. Right? Now, which he keeps implying too much, too much, too much, too much, huge amounts, but he's not given numbers. Why would you not give any numbers? We're five minutes in. He hasn't given any numbers yet. Eating six bananas or drinking that fruit smoothie, it has to put that somewhere. It raises triglycerides, which immediately are stored as fat in your liver, in your pancreas, in your tongue, and other inappropriate places. We all need... So... The six bananas, the fruit smoothies, they raise your triglycerides, and those tri triglycerides are stored inside your liver. So we're going to see if he has the scientific data to prove that. Now, again, he's not even talking about fruit, though. He's talking about fructose. I mean, I came to this video expecting, like, he was going to tell, tell me about the dangers of fruit, but now he's talking about fructose. So I'm, I don't even know if, if, if the rest of this video is even relevant now because of the bait and switch that that he that he pivoted to because he's not talking about fruit anymore i came here expecting to hear all types of disastrous things about fruit but he's just talking about fructose now but he's implying like six bananas and stuff 
But earlier, he said, oh, a lot of fructose, it doesn't raise your blood sugar. But then he's talking about the six bananas. Now, you eat six bananas, it will raise your blood sugar. So is he talking about f six bananas? Is he talking about smoothies? It, are the smoothies using dairy milk, non-dairy milk? Are you adding sugar to the, to the fruit smoothies? Um, you know, are you adding honey or syrup to the smoothies? Um, you know, is he even talking about foods at all? What is he talking? I don't know what he's talking about now. Because now he injected six bananas. So he's, this is getting kind of loose. Because sometimes it implies that he's not talking about food. And then other times he is talking about food. But he's not, he hasn't given any numbers. So I'm kind of confused. I don't really know what he's talking about now. He's oscillating between different things. A little bit of stored fat, but none of us need stored fat in our liver or pancreas or tongue. Number four is a big problem. When you eat or drink fructose, it does not trigger your satiety signal. So it's much easier to overeat carbohydrates if you have a lot of fructose in your diet. It's not signaling your body that you're full. And so you just keep drinking the smoothies and keep eating the fruit and you never really get satiated or full. And so but wait a minute, is he talking about fructose or carbohydrates or what is he talking about now? So I'm kind of confused, right? Because now, so if you have too much fructose in your diet, you're not going to feel hungry and then you'll overeat carbs. Wait a minute, fructose is not, it's something different, right? Fructose is not carbs, it's a different thing. Right, carbohydrates get broken down into glucose. He's talking about fructose. So, but then he's talking about eating too much fruit, which he also didn't specify how much is too much. Um, and now he's talking about, oh, you just feel hungry. You never feel full. Um, does he really think that if you were to eat six bananas that you wouldn't feel full? Does he think that fruit is not filling? Like... If you ever want to test this out, eat a couple apples and see if you feel really hungry, hungry after eating the two apples. Like the two apples or four apples or whatever the case is. Right? Or just eat a big old bowl of fruit and then see if you feel full or really hungry after. Because the thing is, fruit is filled with like water and fiber. And we know fiber signals fullness, right? It signals satiety, right? And so does water. Water also contributes to that. And then there's the overall volume of the fruit. But the thing is, he keeps oscillating back and forth between fructose and fruit. And then now he's saying carbohydrates. So it's not really clear on what he's talking about because he's talking in very squishy, loose, uh, slippery language, right? Like too much, but not giving any numbers. He's using fructose and fruit and carbohydrates interchangeably. So does he mean all of them at the same time? Is he just exclusively talking about one or a mixture of them all? I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. And so this is the thing you want to look out for is the language that people decide to deploy. It's like a media literacy thing because people will sneak things in and then it, it ends up uh, tainting the legitimacy of the claims because of the fast and looseness uh, of the language. So you wind up eating way too many carbohydrates for y'all. Right. Number five, there are multiple studies that show that over ingesting fructose can lead to insulin resistance. And in so he's saying over ingesting. Well, how do you know you're over ingesting? He's not giving any numbers. Um, kind of beating a dead horse here, though. But this is more of like a, a media literacy thing here, uh, because the more he talks, the more bad faith it seems. Like, either he's being dishonest, which is the one way you can read it, and the other way is he's confused and doesn't really understand what he's talking about, right? That's really the kind of the only ways um, that you can interpret this. But let's see what he has to say about insulin resistance. Insulin resistance, as you may or may not go, goes hand in hand with prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, and a host of other chronic medical conditions. Another bad thing that fructose does when you eat or drink too much of it is that it leads to leptin resistance. Lep okay, so now if he's just talking about fructose, as in high fructose corn syrup soft drinks, he'd be correct. 
right? But if he's talking about fruit, well, he's incorrect. Now, he said that he had, he linked to a bunch of studies, and we'll look at those. Um, but I also have studies that I want to show you um, uh, afterwards. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how productive watching the rest of the video is going to be, but I also don't want to omit any important information that he gives here, right? But he mentioned the six bananas and stuff, but then when he started talking about the insulin resistance, then he pivoted back to fructose, and he's, it seems like he's no longer talking about fruit. So it's not clear when he started or stopped talking about fruit and when he started talking about it again. It's not really clear, right? Uh, because of the looseness of the language. Leptin is a very important hormone in your body. It tells your body whether to store fat or not store fat. It also helps with you feeling full or not. When you're ingesting too much fructose, you, you develop leptin resistance, and this is gonna lead to increased fat storage and then you also you're not turning off your hunger signal so you drink or so by the way he's also making the same claim twice because before he said oh when you eat too much fructose um it interferes with satiety signaling as in you don't feel full well the thing that makes you feel full is leptin resistance so when he talks about um the fructose or fruit or carbohydrates I'm not really sure which one he's talking about because he's using these interchangeably um so when you have poor satiety signaling that is leptin resistance so he's repeating leptin resistance. i don't know why he's doing that twice does he assume that satiety signaling and leptin resistance is he assuming that these are two different things because being that he's bringing it up twice it seems as though he doesn't really understand what leptin resistance is but he's explaining it as if he knows what it is. So I don't know why he's bringing this up a second time. Seems a bit odd. Seems redundant. Or eat even more fructose, which leads to even more fat storage. Leptin resistance is a huge, huge deal uh, with the obesity epidemic in the modern society. The number seven problem with ingesting too much fructose is gut problems. Um, many people actually have a huge increase in their IBS or irritable bowel symptoms. They notice a great increase in gas and diarrhea, sometimes constipation. And this is because even though your body cells can't utilize fructose in, in its current form, the certain gut bacteria that live in your large intestine love fructose. And so when you are eating or drinking too much fructose, you're actually feeding these bad bacteria, causing them to multiply much quicker than they would otherwise. They overtake your good bacteria by just outnumbering them, and you wind up with marked gut symptoms of bloating, gas, uh, gas that's not pleasant, uh, diarrhea, and sometimes constipation. Now the bonus issue with fructose. So, so now again, he could be correct. But the thing is, it depends on what he's talking about. Because if he's talking about fruit, well, he's wrong, right? Because fruit contains uh, probiotic cultures, which are basically beneficial bacteria that improve your gut health. And then fruit also contains prebiotics, which serve as a food source for your probiotics, uh, which is your beneficial gut bacteria. So, for example, now, is he talking about fructose, like high fructose corn syrup soft drinks? Or is he talking about papaya? or mangoes, which one is he talking about? Because these are very different things that have very different nutritional implications. This is the reason why you need to be specific about what you're talking about, which he's going out of his way to not do. So you know that glucose, if you eat too much glucose or raise your blood sugar, it actually causes glycation of your cells and tissues. This is what the test hemoglobin A1C, that's what it actually measures. The problem is, is that fructose, even though your body cells can't use it for energy, it actually glycates the cells and tissues in your body seven times greater than glucose. And so eating a high fructose diet or drinking lots of glucose, you're gonna cause a, a huge increase in the production of advanced glycation in products, ages. See the word age in there? Yeah, it actually will make your skin age quicker. It can cause increasing degeneration in your joints. It causes problems all over your body. So 
when you hear someone say that, oh, fruit is, that's, that's you know, your best friend when it comes to dieting and being healthy and losing weight, the fructose in all that fruit that you've been told to eat is actually glycating and aging every cell in your body seven times faster than... Now, if he's going to say that, this is one of those things he made a mistake of being too specific with his language. Now, if you're going to say eating fruit makes you age seven times faster, you need statistical data that demonstrates that. So we'll see if he actually has that data. Um, now, the thing is, when he talks about the glycation, now, he's correct if he's talking about processed sugar and processed fructose, like high fructose corn syrup, soft drinks, uh, junk food, that kind of thing. But he made the mistake of putting that claim on fruit, right? So now this is where you're getting into the territory of like, well, you're just lying now. Either that or you're giving false claims. Now, as a doctor, you shouldn't say it if you don't know if it's true, right? Because that's like a form of medical malpractice. You don't want to make claims you don't know are true. Right? So you can't be like, oh, well, eating fruit ages you. Nobody believes that. Um... As a matter of fact, a lot of skincare products use the enzymes and nutrients found in fruits. Right? Um, so fruits are loaded with things like antioxidants, which are literally chemical compounds that reduce oxidative stress that cause the aging. So when he's talking about fruit, he's dismissing all of the other nutrients in the fruit and just focusing on sugar and fructose, which is kind of bizarre uh, because it's a very irrational thing to do whenever you're talking about a food. Because foods have amino acids, vitamins, minerals, fiber, right? all types of different chem chemical compounds. It's very crude to dismiss all of those things and then cherry pick two nutrients out of them. And then abstract that out to well this food has the these two things in it therefore it produces these results you couldn't really make that claim until you've actually ran that study right you need an epidemiological study in order to demonstrate that you need statistical data to demonstrate that right you would need things like uh, well, I'm not going to... Uh, I'll show you what I mean uh, um, soon enough when we get into scientific data. But let's see what else he has to say here. Thing glucose does. If you know someone who's been eating way too much fructose, please consider sharing this video with them. You're also welcome, as always, to share this video in your groups or on your personal profile, anywhere on social media that you think. Okay, so he's just plugging his stuff here, right? So we're, he's pretty much done with, with all that, right? Okay. Now, let's see... So the first study that he linked to here is glycates HB more than glucose. All right? So let's see, let's pull up this, let's pull up this study here. Got my water going. All right, what is this here? Academic.oop.com. Long-term fructose consumption accelerates glycation and several age-related variables in male rats. Okay, so this is a study done on rats about fructose. So they, I guess they did, what, did they feed the rats fruit let's see uh let's see so abstract right fructose intake has increased steadily during the past two decades fructose like any other okay so this is i guess giving some background here oh uh, let's see here let's see if we can figure out how the study was done 
Uh, we evaluated the effects of fructose intake on some age-related variables. Rats were fed one year a commercial non-purified diet and bad, oh, and had free access to water or 250 grams per liter solutions of fructose, glucose or sucrose. Okay, so they didn't feed the rats fruit, so this study is not making any claims about fruit at all, right? So this is not durable. Uh, okay. <laughs> so that claim isn't really very durable at all. So that's about rats, where they basically uh, fed rats a, a water solution with glucose and fructose in it. All right. So that's not really going to be very helpful to us there. So let's see if he can, if he has any interesting data uh, on uh, fruit. Let's pull up another study that he has here because that one ain't gonna cut it. Uh, let's see. Skin aging. Let's see this one about skin aging. Let's see. All right, let me pull this up full screen. All right. Galactose induced skin aging, the role of oxidative stress. So that's the title. Uh, so this isn't even about fructose. He's talking about galactose, right? Uh, you're going to primarily be getting galactose from dairy. So this would be more of a study that would demonstrate the negative effects of uh, dairy consumption, not fructose or fruit, right? So this study is not going to cut it. <laughs> Did he read these? I don't know if he read these studies, but the, so far we're, we're 0 for 2 at this point. I don't know. He left a lot of them. I don't I don't know if it's worth it to go through all of them because it doesn't really seem like he chose these too carefully. Let's see. Let's see here. Uh, fructose raises triglycerides. Now, is this about fruit or is this going to be about... Well, let's see. Okay. Um, Let's buzz through this real quick. Abstract. Uh, the effects of different dietary sugars with or without exogenously induced hyperinsulinemia on rat plasma triglyceride kinetics have been studied. Glucose, sucrose, or fructose were applied as 10% drinking solutions. The sugar supplemented groups were each divided into subgroups, one receiving... Uh, six units of insulin per day for two weeks. Okay, so this is not about fruit. So this is a rat study with a fructose solution. So this is not even about fruit. Okay, so this isn't going to work either. I have a feeling that all of these fructose studies that he showed, these are not... They didn't conduct these studies with a high fruit diet. Right? Which... In order for his claims to be legitimate, um, he would need to produce those studies. So let's see, now we're 0 for 3. Uh, fructose causes metabolic problems. Do we really need to go through this? Because again, this is about fructose, it's not about fruit. Uh, let's see, fructose raises triglycerides. Uh, being that we're 0 for 3, I don't know how many of these we need to do. Uh, let's see. So we got, because all these are about fructose, fructose and insulin resistance. Now, if all of these studies are going to be about, let me see, I'm just going to pick another one here because I don't want to seem like I'm not giving them a shot. I'm giving them a fair shake here. Uh, so we do fructose causes metabolic problems, fructose raises triglycerides, fructose insulin resistance. Let's pick this one. In, gl glucose insulin resistance. Let's see if this has anything to do with fruit. 
<clears throat> uh, let's see here. So consuming fructose sweetened, not glucose sweetened beverages increases visceral fat adiposity and lipids and decreases insulin sensitivity in overweight slash obese humans. So right out the gate, right, this isn't this doesn't have anything to do with fruit either, because they're talking about sweetened beverages. This has nothing to do with fruit. Did he read these studies? I don't think he read any of these studies. All right. Well, um, this seemed a bit lazy. So um, I don't know. This doesn't look like he did any of this in good faith. This seems like he's uh, misinforming people. This this looks like malintent. Because if all of these studies are going to be about fructose and they're using, like, you know, beverages, if they're using water on rats, they're, you know, they're having rats drink fructose solutions, well, that's not going to cut it. Because the video is about fruit, or at least that's what he implied. But the thing is, is that if you're going to make these claims about fruit, well, all the studies here, fructose, 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 fructose. Okay, so none of these are about fruit, right? They're all about fructose. Okay, fair enough. Let me see if I can bear my point out here. Okay. So check this out. Okay. So here we go. Paradoxical effects of fruit on obesity. All right. Now, this is actually a combination of a bunch of different studies. So the, let's, let's see if we see the abstract here. Obesity is exponentially increasing regardless of its, of its preventable characteristics. The current measures for preventing obesity have failed to address the severity and prevalence of obesity. So alternative approaches based on nutritional and diet changes are attracting attention from the treatment of obesity. Fruit contains large amounts of simple sugars, glucose, fructose, sucrose, etc., which are well known to induce obesity. Thus, considering the amount of simple sugars has found in fruit, it is reasonable to expect that their consumption should contribute to obesity rather than weight reduction. However, Epidemiological research has consistently shown that most types of fruit have anti-obesity effects. Thus, due to their anti-obesity effects, as well as their vitamin and mineral contents, Health organizations are suggesting that consumption of fruit for weight reduction uh, purposes. Uh, these contradictory characteristics of fruit with respect to human body weight. Uh, with respect to human body weight management motivated us to study previous research to understand the contribution of different types of fruit to weight management. In this review article, we, an we analyze and discuss the relationships between fruit and their anti-obesity effects based on numerous possible underlying mechanisms. And we conclude that each type of fruit has different effects on body weight. All right, so basically, and you see here, we got the introduction. There's links to several other studies in here. So you see these highlighted in blue. So we got this one here, World Health Organization fact sheet. Uh, these here, two, three, and four. So these are the citations, the studies, right? That kind of thing. Um, I can actually put a link to this in the description so you can look at this yourself, right? Okay, so. Uh, number two, anti-obesity effects of fruit. So this goes over the anti-obesity effects of fruit. So just 
Quickly reading here, numerous interventional and observational human trials based on longitudinal and cross-section studies designed ranging from small to large population sets in various countries have investigated the close association between the consumption of fruit and obesity based on precise anthropometric analysis related to obesity, such as body weight, BMI, and waist circumference. WC for short, the majority of these studies have suggested that fruit intake is inversely associated with obesity. As shown in figure one, which refers to this graph, the human studies of the association between fruit and obesity can be broadly classified into three different categories. Number one, intervention randomized clinical trials. Number two, prospective cohort studies, and number three, cross-section studies. So we're looking at an abundance of statistical data, epidemiological data, right, that has been consistently and continuously uh, been replicated and produced um, beneficial results of fruit consumption uh, as far as weight loss is concerned. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to read all of this here, right? It's quite long, as you can see, right? So I'll put a link to this uh, if you really want to read the literature here. You want to do some digging, all right? Uh, let's see. So there's that, okay? So what else should we look at, right? Because he basically made a bunch of claims about fruit is going to make you gain weight and, and, and it's going to make you gain weight in all these different varieties of ways, that kind of thing, right? Gout, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I could probably pull up a study on uh, gout and things like that uh, and the purines that I mentioned earlier. He mentioned insulin resistance. Now, here's the interesting thing, right? Um, and one thing I noticed, and I'll do more videos on keto advocates, uh, you have a lot of people on the internet saying, oh, you know, sugar is bad, it leads you to diabetes, insulin resistance, fructose bad, it leads to diabetes, insulin resistance. And then they pull up studies about sugar and fructose, but in a vacuum, right? Like what I just showed you with the rat studies and the, the, sweetened, be the sweetened beverages, things like that. But they haven't done, they haven't produced the study or the data that I just produced about actual fruit and the diet and the effects that it has which is what they would need in order to make the claims that they make. So the question is, right, what causes insulin resistance, right? What is insulin resistance? Now, insulin resistance essentially is a form of lipotoxicity, right? Or it's a result of lipotoxicity, where essentially the more fat you store inside your liver and throughout your body, the more ectopic fat you store inside your cells, the more visceral fat you store on top of your organs, the more fat you store inside your liver, this leads to lipotoxicity, which leads to insulin resistance and then a deeper and deeper and deeper form of insulin resistance until you are officially diagnosed with something like type 2 diabetes. Okay, so if fruit consumption has an inverse correlation with weight gain, well, what does that imply for... Um, insulin resistance and diabetes, right? Because insulin resistance makes you gain weight and it prevents you from losing weight because of your body's inability to use glucose for energy. So essentially what happens is you eat food, the carbohydrates break down into simpler forms like glucose and fructose. The fructose gets sent into your liver and then is later converted into a form of glucose, which is a usable uh, form of energy that is then sent to your cells the glucose from the carbohydrates goes straight to your cells and is shuttled into your cells with a hormone called insulin, which is released from your pancreas. The glucose is shuttled into your cells and then your cells convert that glucose into usable energy via mitochondria, okay? Your mitochondria are the energy producing factories of your cells. So now, When we talk about mitochondrial dysfunction, 
insulin resistance. Well, what causes these things, right? What prevents your body from using glucose for energy, right? What causes this, this problem? Let's look at some let's look at some data here real quick. And this will I'll save this for another video because he made it claims that I don't want to I'll probably do another video about saturated fat. Uh, because that's like its own separate topic if we're gonna talk about insulin resistance, lipotoxicity, type 2 diabetes, and all that type of stuff. Right. But I want to show you something here real quick. So let's take a look at this. Mitochondrial dysfunction is a key pathway that links saturated fat intake to the development and progression of NAFLD. NAFLD is an acronym for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, meaning fatty liver disease that is uh, developed and progressed without the usage or consumption of alcohol all right so this comes from diet so right in the headline link saturated fat right okay so if we, re if we do a little bit of reading here non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the most common form of liver disease and is characterized by fat accumulation in the liver Hypercaloric diets generally increase uh, hepatic fat accumulation, whereas hypocaloric diets decrease liver fat content. In addition, there is evidence to suggest that moderate amounts of unsaturated fatty acids seem to be protective for the development of a fatty liver, while consumption of saturated fat acids SFA for short, appears to predispose toward hepatic stetosis. Recent studies highlight a key role of mitochondrial dysfunction in the development and progression of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It is proposed that changes in mitochondrial structure and function are key mechanisms by which SFA lead to the development and progression of NAFLD. They use all of these abbreviations. Uh, in this review, it is described how SFA intake is associated with liver stetosis and decreases the efficiency of the respiratory transport chain. This results in the production of reactive oxygen species in damage to nearby structures, eventually leading to inflammation, apoptosis, and scarring of the liver. Furthermore, studies demonstrating that SFA intake affects the composition of mitochondrial membranes are presented and this process accelerates the progression of NAFLD. I'm just going to say non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, it is likely to, it is likely that events are intertwined and reinforce each other, leading to a constant deterioration in health. Uh, by the way, uh, SFA <clears throat> stands for uh, saturated fat acids, saturated fatty acids. So this study basically explains how that works, right? If you want to look into this whole thing, it's kind of long. I'm not going to read this whole thing in the video, right? Because kind of a separate thing. I could talk more about dietary fat and lipotoxicity in another video. And I'll, but I'll link to this study since I brought it up here in the video. All right. So. Uh, essentially, you know, what, what that study and studies like it demonstrate that uh, having a diet with a significant of saturated fat leads to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is a form of lipotoxicity, and it can get severe enough to the point where it progresses from fatty liver disease, disease to uh, cirrhosis of the liver, which is uh, extreme scarring and dysfunction and damage to your liver, right? Um, and... 
as your liver gets worse, this impairs insulin resistance, thus uh, slipping you further into diabetes, right? And then you end up having an A1C score going from 6 to 6.5 to 7 to 7.5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and to the point where, you know, you're having blood sugar levels of like, you know, 230, 280, 300, etc. And even waking up in the morning with really high blood sugar of like, you know, 210 and stuff like that. I work with a lot of diabetics. I have a lot of experience reversing type 2 diabetes. So I get to see their blood sugar numbers that they report to me because this is what we keep track of. Um, and so all of them, they all have the same uh, food choices, all of their diets, high in saturated fat, uh, mainly coming from animal products, dairy, eggs, meat, seafood, all very, very abundant sources of saturated fat, um, butter, uh, cooking with oil, right? Mm -hmm. Cooking with oil also is a big contributor, right? Um, so when they talked about the development of uh, oxygen reactive species, right? That gets into free radicals that run around, you float around your body, destroy your cells, create oxidative stress, inflammation. This can lead to things like neuropathy, edema, right? Which if you are like deeply diabetic, you've probably experienced these things. Uh, constipation, bloating, gas, gut health issues, all this type of stuff. And if you're experiencing th these things, I can guarantee you that you didn't get it from uh, having a high fruit diet. So uh, I think I'll leave it there. So I'll do more video reviews like this. But this is pretty much, you know, despite the fact that this guy is a doctor of 20 plus years of experience, Either he is aggressively and extraordinarily ignorant and lazy and doesn't read the studies that he cites, or he's lying. Right? Um, I'm not going to attack his character or anything personally. I don't know him. But just based on the things that he says or has said in the video, we can see that clearly these things are not true. And he hasn't successfully produced the evidence for any of this stuff at all. So when anybody tells you they make these claims about fructose, ask them, how much fructose is too much? Give me a number for how much fructose is too much. Or give me a range, right? Give me a range, right? Give me a set amount of grams of fructose is too much. And then show me the math of how you've calculated that number, right? Get granular. Give me some specific numbers. Don't throw out the word too much because the word too much, we don't know what that means, right? Give me a number. Um, and also, uh, do you have any statistical data uh, on fruit consumption? That's, I'm not talking about feeding lab rats uh, water with fructose in it. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about uh, giving obese people soft drinks with fructose in it, right? Or giving obese people um, soft drinks and you got different groups and the one group is given a soft drink that's loaded up with glucose and the other one that's loaded up with fructose and then doing a study with all obese people. Uh, <laughs> And then think that, first of all, you need a study with people at a healthy, you need a, a study with healthy people, and then you have to have set diets, and then you compare the diets. Now, here's the giveaway, and this is the reason why I think he's deliberately being dishonest. He cited the American Diabetes Association in the American Heart Association, and he implied that they were wrong in the guidelines that they were given. Now, if that's true, the, the primary way, really the only way, that he would be able to demonstrate that he's correct and they're wrong in their guidelines is he would need to provide epidemiological data using their dietary guidelines and then producing the negative results in line with the claims that he's making from those guidelines. He didn't do that. Now, there's two things that could have happened. Either he looked for that data, didn't find it, and chose to make these claims anyway, or he didn't even look for that data at all. Right? Um, either way, both options, negligent, highly dishonest, lazy, etc. Um, these are not personal attacks on him. I'm just describing uh, the behavior. Right? So... 
Uh, this is just a quick video going over media literacy, scientific claims, and how to check some of these things out in real time.